Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. My guest is Glenn Fay, who is a research fellow here at the CIS, although he has experience, in, in, among other things, in running a pizza shop. G'day, Rob. Thanks G'day. for having me. Firstly, what, what, what are we talking about, liberalism? Well, look, we, we know liberalism as essentially a guiding philosophy for the way that ultimately people like us, classical liberals, view the world. There's a set of ideas that really underpin that, um, and, and I've, I have kind of have had a go at putting those into a context, um, which I'll get to in a second, but liberalism is essentially a set of ideas and ideals, and ultimately those ideals, I think, are the ones, is what's really under threat here in, in the current environment and have really lost traction, particularly when it comes to right-of-centre politics and, okay. and the, the priorities facing those of us that are inclined towards right-of-centre politics and also broadly the electorate, which here in Australia, I would argue, is broadly a right-of-centre electorate. What, what Firstly, can you identify the ideals you've got in mind? So I would put it down to a set of probably five main points. The first one is about limited government and spontaneous ordering in order to uh, achieve the best societal and economic ends. The second of those is that the individual and personal responsibility about the, around the individual is superior to the collective good and the, co- and the, the needs of a group. The third is ultimately a scepticism about power and, and um, really a belief in the wisdom of individual self-determination. The fourth is that free markets, open societies and civil society are the best way of dealing with economic and social problems. And the fifth and final is that essentially tolerance, consensus and civility are the way to solve our problems. Now, those ideals sound, on the face of it, very attractive. Though maybe we can unpack some of them. But you believe that those ideas are under threat. Why? Well, I, I can go. Th- I can explain for a few of these, but there's, there's both good reasons and bad reasons. So particularly the movement around conservative populism, I would argue, has got some legitimate claims and gripes with the system of classical liberalism and what classical liberalism is failing to address that we can see with our own eyes um, within within the societies and um, economy that we live. So, but there's also the case that there are competing ideas from the left, particularly around- Let's break these down. Mm. From what you call the right, what are, there are failing, you're saying there are things that are failing Mm. for some people in some of these ideals in practice. What do, you, what do you have in mind? Well, so this, we, on the, in classical liberalism, we've always been grounded in the idea that equality of opportunity is a, is a, is a, a, a social ideal that, that we have. One concern that, that those on the right of centre or inclined to the right of centre will, will argue is that social mobility nowadays feels like more than just economics. It's not just about earning similar wages as peers in different occupations. There's also a cultural divide so that different occupations, even earning similar wages, and there's great examples here in Australia with those those of us that work in the trades, for instance, that, that are earning a really good living, but still feel excluded from the cultural elite who, uh, who essentially occupy uh, a space in our society that's outsized in terms of influence. And this has created a sense that even with economic mobility, it hasn't translated into a sense of the social mobility that those of us that are classical liberals had really hoped would be a frictionless process. Is this because liberalism um, and your ideals suggest this is kind of blind to issues of group and power? It, it thinks of individuals as all as we're not not connected in group, where in fact what you just what you just analysed is a form of basic kind of class structure in the society, not well, just economic structure. It's probably the the reinterpretation of class structure yeah. in our societies that 
that we've a failure on our on our end has been to recognize that even the even when we've overcome some of the traditional barriers around class new ones have emerged and particularly those ones around education and and that kind of status that really makes a big difference and we see this in the the inner city um, you know latte sipper type folks <laughs> and those and those that that are ba basically everywhere else in the country and we ask ourselves if we look at the changing electoral map where does the right of center of politics find is where is it finding its new home it's not in the inner city amongst elite and in as in the one in the old days it once was it's really a lot more with those uh, those Australians that are that are hardworking, uh, believe in merit and principles of that kind, that do feel somewhat excluded from the new structures that have emerged. Yeah, let I me mean, grant that. Um, why is that a threat then to liberalism? Well, this it's a threat and an opportunity in, in a sense. One reason why it's a threat is it feels to me that the what liberalism's offering as a solution is a solution to an old problem, not a new set of problems. So when liberalism was in its heyday, and we often attribute this to particularly the, the so-called neoliberal era, you know, the, the period of the 70s and 80s and, and here in Australia in the 90s, that the era of Reagan and Thatcher and, and uh, Hawke and Keating and so on, we attribute this to the time when liberalism effectively overcame an, the alternative, which was statism. And liberalism had really good answers to those problems. Smaller government and freer societies were a much better alternative to the, the uh, big government and, and, um, and uh, restrictions upon individual, uh, individual liberty. But today it feels that we've already reaped some of the benefits from what that neoliberal period has to offer. We are now faced with a set of, other, of new challenges and I would argue that the battlefield is now quite different. And we've also, as classical liberals, need to adapt to the, that new environment. Has, uh, it's interesting, throughout preparing, preparing this series, I find almost no one has got a brief for neoliberalism anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, it, it, it produced value. It, uh, one person called it, uh, re, 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 I think, realising the assets. But now it seems to have no longer working or no longer getting um, attention because it's seen to be a precursor to inequality and exclusion as, as well as success. And it is true, is it not, that finances of the very rich are much higher than they were and others are fitting left out? Is that fair? Well, that, that's true and it's, and it's not true. So it really, it really depends on what stats you're looking at. But overall, in the field that I do most of my work is, is that of education. Yeah. And I would argue that education has had a large focus on improving equity outcomes as a, as a priority. But a consequence of making... By, by, it, by that you mean not, not starting in the same place, but ending in the same place. That's right. That's right. And I would argue that much like other spheres of, of our economy and society, that's produced an adverse outcome. Of course, it's been very well intentioned and, and, and policymakers and, and schools and other actors have done the right thing in trying to address those inequities because education is such a great tool for, for, mo for social mobility. But the, the result of this, of the emphasis on equity has been undermining of excellence and undermining to some extent of merit. And that's taken away the mission and promise that we as classical liberals had, which was that equality of opportunity is ultimately what but we surely, what we equity outcomes, you call it, is not a liberal or neoliberal. It belongs to some other way of thinking. Well, to, to the extent that we create a level playing field, that's a distinctly liberal yes. uh, but concept. Not, but not a, but not a, not a level score no, in the game. No, but then there is a push, particularly on the progressive left nowadays, which is that it's not enough to, to pursue uh, even equity of outcomes. It actually needs to be more than that. It needs to be inequity of outcomes to redress for past indiscretions. So you've got a you've got this push that we're still talking a language that's lost a bit of currency in the uh, in where the where demands and, and experiences are for for everyday people. But that but let me take you back to your comment about the right from the right of centre uh, losing faith in liberalism. I I don't expect the progressive left. It's not a great loss to hear the progressive left 
don't believe in in a, in a liberal vision. Uh, for all, that's that, that's a classic difference. But you're saying that the right of centre has lost confidence in liberalism. You want to unpack that? I'd, I'd like to unpack that a little further than you've given me so far. Well, I, I'd. I think what I'd call it is really an identity crisis on on the right of centre. So the right of centre, we we know we've had and, and there's been for some time a, a splintering, and we see this a lot here in Australia in our Liberal Party, which is essentially a, a so-called broad church of yes. conservatives and more economically liberal. Um, the phrase that's quite commonly asserted is socially liberal but economically conservative uh, and these, these kind of different labels that are put on um, subgroupings within our Liberal Party. What, uh, what, that, what, this, what that's failing though is that there's also other movements in right of centre politics elsewhere that have not necessarily manifested so much here. If we look at the United States, of course, the and in other areas of Europe as well, the right of centre has pushed essentially between pursuing more of a conservative populism. Yes. And this, and this, I think, is where the real uh, crisis lies for liberalism. That uh, you're quite right that on the progressive left, it's quite hard to persuade uh, and move them to a, to a position that makes sense to classical liberals. But we must find ways of reconciling that difference in the right of centre with. Uh, with those that would cons would call themselves now conservative populists, conservative populists, even reactionaries. These are people who write against the elites. Uh, in America, I know the word liberal is not used as we're using it. <laughs> Quite the fact, it often is spoken to speak of the parties that are on the centre left, mm -hmm. which may indicative mm -hmm. that there is a certain um, ch chameleon-like nature of liberalism in different different societies, different versions of it, different forms. Well, there's no doubt. For instance, European liberalism is a, is much more is much closer to uh, a, a progressive leftism that, that what we would label essentially progressive left is is much more in line with what European liberalism looks like. And there's there's a big there's certainly a backlash to that approach in a lot of a lot of Europe. And you know a lot of people might have might well have been uh, very much encouraged, particularly someone like Emmanuel Macron's rise yeah. in recent years as essentially a centralist liberal now really under threat from uh, a relatively extreme conservative populist that uh, in Marine Le Pen that 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 is potentially a movement that may has not really extended beyond that um, that one context as well I'm Rob Forsyth and this is liberalism in question and my guest today is Glenn Fay Glenn um you, 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 say, you talk about competing grievance systems, uh, the new world in which liberalism finds itself um, without, at the moment you're saying, without out effective answers or without effective, uh, what would effective answers look like? Or is, or is liberalism a movement which um, its day is passing? Well, ultimately, the problem with the system systems of grievances, um, and I'll, I'll explain what, why, where each of those grievances lie sure. in a moment. But the problem with, and, and ultimately, what what I, I hope the conclusion is after I describe that is that, in fact, the problem with this grievance system is that it's very hard to overcome. It's very hard to overcome that that grievance because it is quite firm, quite firmly ingrained. Our job as classical liberals is to find ways that we can reconcile those grievances. We can't wish them away. Can you give an example? Well, I, I, I would essentially say we've got three different strong currents in politics at the moment, uh, some of which are very present here in Australia and some less so. The first of those is, is leftist, popul uh, leftist populism. And their grievance ultimately is that the economic system itself is broken. So this is where you hear a lot of claims and around big business corporations don't pay their fair share of tax and they force down wage, workers' wages and employment conditions and yes. give, give us this a result of permanently insecure work. And just, just interrupt, but, I, but I, I want to keep hearing you on your three examples. For many people, neoliberalism was thought to be a free kick for big business, mm. not the individual, and that may capture something of the what you're saying. And, and this is why some of this grievance exists, is that we've, we've failed to necessarily reconcile where legitimate grievances have arisen. Uh, and, and there's a sense that there's got to be a reconciliation with all of that in light of some of those major events of the last few years. And, 
and that and that's this rise of uh, particularly conservative populism, but but certainly the other forms as well. well. In, in, you mentioned three. What are the other two? So the second is really is the really the progressive style, of, which argues not partly that the economic system is broken, but fundamentally that the social system, the social structure is broken. Ultimately, that there's a sense of prejudice that exists within our society that needs to be overcome. And this is what's given rise to the complaints around intersectionality, uh, grievance, you know, the, grie the broader grievance culture. You know, there's hierarchies of victimhood and so on. So this is to do with concern about structural racism, uh, various phobias um, and, and so forth that many people regard as the key problem in our society. That that's what you're talking about. Yes. So what it ultimately leads to is the idea that social empowerment can't occur until you've overcome a set of of the, of, uh, of grievances that exist within society. You need to subvert a whole lot of history and, and social structure in order to reorder society. And the, and the third one? The third one is, is I think, the one that, that, that is, I think, most interesting to me and the one that, that is most relevant to the conversation that we have to have as classical liberals. And this is that... This is really the conservative populist argument that not so much that the economic system is broken, not so much that the social structure is broken, but that the contract effectively between the elites of society and in particular the state, but also the mainstream media and the inner city and so on, that there's a sense that that system is what's broken. The individual and the state in particular have ha now have a fractured relationship that there's a sense of a bubble and a distance from what the needs are and experiences of everyday people and what is be, what the priorities and, and uh, expectations are from, uh, from, uh, from central government. And in a sense, the reason why I say it's interesting to us as classical liberals is the classical liberal tradition ultimately started out of a scepticism about power, the, the French Revolution and so on was all about a sense of self-determination that those that are ruling us don't necessarily know what's best for us. So I can see a sense that there's a stream of where liberalism was founded that exists in this current, uh, in this current, um, this particular grievance, which is why I think that we need to find a home in which our ideas can once again be meaningful to people that have suffered from this grievance. Uh, the, the, the French Revolution did go bad very quickly. <laughs> it had some problems. <laughs> and and, and that, that may even be inherent, not just an accident, but it may have been inherent in the kind of ideal remaking of humanity vision. Um, I often contrast that with uh, the French Revolution with other revolutions of a liberal nature, both uh, in the Scottish Enlightenment and the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. what, what, what this... this uh, what, what lack of confidence in what you may call the social contract, without begging any questions, whether I'm not going, to, I'm not going all Rousseau on you here at this point. <laughs> um, this is a threat to liberalism because people are going to look for illiberal solutions to the problem. I'm, I'm looking at what, why is this grievance a, a, a difficulty for a for a, a good working liberal society, which is what we're looking for. Well, what, well, possibly the main reason is that the sense there's a sense that not only is there distance and a gap between the state and the elites and, and the ordinary people, but that they can't be reconciled, that the media is and politicians are corrupt, that they uh, that there's a sense that there's a vested interest that exists that sim can't simply be overcome through the understanding and consensus building that we as liberals have taken to be the way of solving problems. Ultimately, the solutions that are posed by someone like Donald Trump and were quite popular with people, whether we think it's whether we think it's relevant or not, was to drain the swamp. Yes. This yes. this is this was, if anything, if more than anything, a fundamental claim of conservative populism is that only once you drain the swamp can you finally uh, re-enfranchise people that only, have been, that only have non politicians power. can run politics effectively. The claim. Well, that's right, but I think it goes a little bit more than just about politics, because and that's why right. I've grouped it with okay. with other elements of societies, elites, and so on, because I think it comes a little bit to the idea of experts and uh, and this obsession we seem to have in society with expertise, um, that there's someone that knows how my life should be lived better than I do. 
And that skepticism, I think, is actually got a liberal tinge to it that I think deserves tapping into. Doesn't a society need to have, a, a liberal society I'm talking about now, one which has your qualities of people in freedom negotiating with each other, um, individual enterprise leading, well, everyone doing their own thing, meeting to everyone gets better in some way. That's, that's the great mm-hmm. liberal hope that, that by giving people freedom, you'll not have a mess, you'll actually have a better situation in the long run. That's mm-hmm. your self-organising mm-hmm. principle. But that does not need, or does it not also need at some point, an underlying culture of, of an imagined community that we are, that we are, I'm not going to sing now, but we are one <laughs> in some really important sense. Well, there's otherwise, it doesn't necessarily become fractious and and turned inward. And well, I, there's 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 one sense, one current that is pulling us apart, and one that's that the conservative populists that appear to be trying to forge find as sort of forging a sense of togetherness. So one that's te- that's essentially pulling us apart is the intersectionality movement. You know, while you know, it's not that ordinary people necessarily use the language of intersectionality. It does play out when in their workplaces. There's an HR department that uh, that that ensures that certain uh, whether they're gender quotas or anything like this. That intersectionality does play out into people's ordinary lives. They don't necessarily have a name for it, but they experience it and they feel that it, that it's dividing us. Where the conservative populists seek a sense of togetherness, we don't necessarily need to agree with, but a lot of conservative populism has got a very nationalist tinge to it, that you know, where t- we have this thing in common. We have this sense of our country, you know, uh, particularly the US, is of course, is where this is very strong, is that you know, we need to look after ourselves first, buy America, American first, is now a bipartisan commitment. And in a sense, this happens here too. Like, of course, there's, there's um, very much a, a deglobalization idea that we need to revive yeah, yeah. Australian industry first and so on. This is where conservative populists try to find a home for community and, and so on. And isn't, is, is, it could not be said that one of liberalism's blind spots is to the nation mm-hmm. as a people and not, not just a state, I mean, mm-hmm. and to the family. In the sense, individuals are free, into free floating, and these two things, nation and family, in a sense, frame and shape individuals in in communities. And liberalism, on the whole, hasn't got a language for that. I think that's quite true, and I think it's something that probably traditional conservatives have had trouble with as well, because traditional conservative conservatism has been very much community yes. based, you know, yes, and of roles of churches and so on, and other civil society. And it's been hard to find new language and new vernacular that makes sense for particularly the, the world as it is today, where families are quite different. Family structures are quite different. We have smaller families. We live we live on our own for a long part of our adult lives and so on. We live in a, a, a sense of a more individual uh, and uh, almost solitary life where we, we view ourselves as isolated from a common whole. And in a sense, that's something that liberalism or liberal society has created. We've not, we've not yet found the way to properly reconcile community. But it's not, not always satisfying to live in that isolated individual role. It's often um, uh, destructive of human flourishing. Well, look, that, that's quite true. Right. And, and uh, a lot of people will note that you know, elements around social trust and social capital, Absolutely. Um, and that's probably something that, that, you, that you would know better than I, but... I think that that's absolutely oh, no, true. I, I, I'm no more trusting than you are. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. There's strong evidence of uh, decline in social trust, which itself damages the ability of a liberal society to work. Mm-hmm. That is, I understand it, a liberal society, freedom comes where there's trust. Where there's distrust, freedom goes because you carry a gun by your, on your pillow. <laughs> you, you, you don't trust the others. Therefore, the, the only answer of some say is the government's got to come in and enforce safety and well, then, well, you, then you lose your liberalism well quite true and and if you know in a sense returning a little bit to some of those grievances they've all there's all a sense that there's distrust of others driving those so when it comes to left-wing populists they will say that you can't trust your boss for instance your employer doesn't have your best interests at heart so you need to there's a there's a 
it's re- really revisiting that tension that's you need an arbitrator and a mediator and that should be big governments. Now, Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Fay, you've been somewhat pessimistic in your so far, <laughs> telling us the problems. Uh, are you optimistic then about the future of liberalism or do you think these issues that you identified, sad as it may be, uh, regretted it may be, mean that liberalism is in for a very hard time? Well, I think we've got to accept that liberalism has never been official uh, party doctrine, you know, it's not that liberalism was in was you know understand, yeah. in some way practiced entirely the way that the ideals would suggest. So in a sense, liberalism itself has always been in question. You know, so it's not that today is somehow that different to any other time in the past. The question we have now is that we, as classical liberals, need to find ways of adapting where we're at to meet where. And give, give any idea what that might look like then? I'll put my question that way. What, what is the way forward? I think the way forward is that the grievances that, that the left have become concerned about are irreconcilable with classical liberalism. But I would argue that there is some common ground that can be, can be met and found with conservative populists. We need to take seriously where that grievance emerges from and try to offer solutions to it. I don't have those for you right now. No, no. But but I think that I think that that's our best hope, and well, that's the way that we can keep those ideas moving along in a way that's that's constructive. And another speaker in, our, in 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 the series, Tim Wilson, has written a book called The New Social Contract. He argues from a slightly different point of view to yours, but nonetheless, the similar concern that unless liberalism is seen to work in the lives of people, in I use the phrase lived experience. <laughs> um, it, it, no, one's, no one's in there to bat for it. And he, he suggests there's issues to do with demographic inequalities and so forth. You're, you're saying a similar thing. It has to find a way to actually work in people's lives rather than just be an ideal that, that uh, doesn't touch them. Yeah, that, that's quite right. And, and you've got to find a way that we can uh, essentially not just promise that the world will be better when we all cooperate, for instance. We need to find fruitful ways of, of demonstrating that. Um, starting in small scale, I mean, is this a matter of, of actually finding places and neighbourhoods where liberal virtues uh, are lived out? Well, I think it's, it's, it starts in people's everyday lives and everyday exchanges. You know, the, the more that we overcome those, those, um, those uh, maladies of that are coming from the illiberalism in the workplace, in, in the home, and in the economy and so on, the more that people can see those being confronted and, and addressed, uh, the more that I think we win people to our side. Now, you, compared to me, you're a young man. I, I've been called that before, but uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily hold anymore. No, I, I understand that uh, in your early 30s, but uh, I'm, am I right? You're not, uh, people like you are not common you often, inter- often interact with and talk to, uh, I much I appreciate, with, with progressive people your own age and so mm-hmm. forth. And that does seem to be the, the zeitgeist. Why are you different? Well, I should admit that, um, that while I do, I, do, uh, I do mix with people on the other side of things, I have to admit that there's, there's, it's quite difficult to, to persuade and move some people that are my age that it's certainly much more... I'm asking you, why you, not them? Well, it's... What, what have you seen that, that, that you don't see in your contemporaries? Well, one of the, well probably the, the, the example that I, I mostly give in, in respect to that question is that I had the pleasure of running businesses when I was young. I was able to, I, uh, I took, on, took the plunge of... And this is something that, that, um, that Tim Wilson will talk to. I took the plunge into home ownership relatively young. Yes. Some of those, some of those, yes. um, some of the things that matter to us so much as uh, classical liberals are experiences that that I've had the opportunity to be involved with at a relatively young age. And when I when I hear some of the complaints and and priorities of some other people my age that have not ex- had similar experiences, they come with a set of, a set of world a certain worldview that. Um, that, that I would consider unenlightened um, <laughs> from not having had some real experiences in life. And, and to an extent, some of the, this comes back to 
some of the uh, the experience of overeducation to some extent that a lot of people, many people my age, have uh, taken on university degrees and entered professional careers. Some of whom have been a little bit unsatisfied with where that's taken them, mm. mm. and have not seen things like the salary rises that, that they were hoping for. They're not living the lives ultimately that they, that they had hoped for. And I think that that does breed a sense of frustration with the system. And, and this is where the, uh, those on the progressives particularly can find uh, fertile ground that, that people my age and certainly those that are younger especially uh, but in, see but the if, system as being But ruined. in your case, you said you, 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 you were involved in small business. Mm-hmm. Um, you, took, you took risks mm-hmm. and challenges. And therefore, in a way, for you, liberalism has actually been a lived experience that's worked. That's right. Um, um, it's, it has its challenges and it's not easy, but you can. It, it, uh, there's a sense that you inculcates a set of values that when you can see reward for effort, you can see that, you know, the what risk taking means uh, and you can see where the, the importance of, you know, what the role that merit plays and so on. I think when you see those things in your own experience, that I think that that does uh, support a world, a certain worldview. How interesting! Perhaps the way to revive liberalism is people should get out more. <laughs> well, you wouldn't be the first to to think that. I think <laughs> there's so many further questions that that this raises, and uh, time is caught up with us. Um, thank you very much, Glenn, for that comment. Not just in theory, but something you've actually lived yourself. This has been another podcast of Liberalism in Question from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been the independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Check out the links on the website to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.